Guten Tag. Welcome back to the Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we are taking a look at the Model 1916 Infanterie Shield. This is something I've wanted to do for a while. I've been sitting on this shield for probably close to a year at this point. Figured we'd start the video with uh, shooting the good old Gewehr 98 through it. I think it was a success. This video is going to be a little different. I'm sure we're going to go over this a little bit more as we go along, but we're starting out the video after uh, after this intro here with talking about the history of the infantry shield, and then we're going to from there be moving into my restoration process for it. As when I got this thing, it was way more crusty than it is right now. So very end of the video there's gonna be a little before and after picture if you don't want to watch the whole restoration and just want to see how it started and where it ended there's a little before and after in like the last 10 seconds of the video or so so meantime let's go ahead and go into the gun room and talk about the history of sniper shields and the model 1916 in particular before we get going on the history of the model 1916 infantry shield uh which literally translates to infantry shield, by the way. Uh, I'm just using the German word for it as this is a German item. But anyway, before we get going too far on the history on it, there's a couple things worth noting at the outset here. First off, this video is going to be very different from anything we've ever done before. As you've probably already noticed, uh, you've probably seen me in more than one uh, different outfit and probably with a couple different hairstyles over the course of this video that is because this video has been shot very long form usually i shoot a video all in one day uh this one uh the end of the video is actually the beginning and what we're shooting here in the middle has been shot in the middle i have yet to shoot the intro uh as of uh, the moment of recording this segment and i'll probably uh weather permitting be shooting that this weekend uh actually i'm probably going to do it whether or not it's raining because i'm very much intending on having this posted by the 20th and that gets me into my next point this is going to be the last item that we take a look at uh before the year is out the next video that we're going to be doing is the year-end wrap-up uh either on december 31st or uh, uh january 1st so 2021 is almost dead feel it and I am so excited about it. Also, this is the first non-firearm uh, item that we've taken a look at and I know I've talked in the past about potentially taking a look at knives of which still fall a little bit more into the weaponry category than a shield does, though as you may have noticed I kind of couldn't help but start the video with featuring a weapon as these would be used in tandem with a rifle. Uh, usually something scoped or just by a guy that happened to be a crack shot. If you guys enjoy this type of video and would like to see more uh, kind of field gear demos, um, I'm very open to doing more stuff like this. I do have a bit of field gear and little knickknacks from World War One and Two and helmets and such. I'd very much like to do demos of them if you guys would like to see them, but if you want me to stick to guns... I've got guns, I've got knives as well, and I do intend to do at least a attempt at a uh, blade review of something from World War One or World War Two. But now to get into the history of the Model 1916, again, infantry shield, sniper shields, also known as trench shields, were widely used by multiple powers throughout World War One. The most uh, prolific use of them seems to have been on the Western Front by the British and the Germans, though the French had a version of a shield that they used. Uh, I believe the Austro-Hungarian Empire did as well. And there were probably others. They're not something that was uncommon uh, when the air is filled with lead and exploding uh, projectiles and metal. You're generally going to see people going to ground and trying to find ways to protect themselves. The British were the first to adopt something of a shield. They called theirs a set shield. It actually looked fairly similar to this. These were widely used on the Western Front. They deployed over 200,000 of them. And the Germans caught on pretty quick. The British variant would stop uh, machine gun rounds up to, I believe, 50 yards. Or uh, 50 yards and out, rather. When I say up to, it's kind of a... 
a hard a hard one to know exactly how to state it. When I say that the the British one could stop up to 50 yards, I'm I'm essentially saying 50 yards and further. If you're within 50 yards, you're probably going to cut through it. This example, for instance, could stop 303 British up to 100 yards, and then anything past 100 yards, with the exception of uh, uh, armor piercing rounds and uh, any large caliber caliber hunting rifles that the British requisitioned, of which was something that they did pretty widely through World War One as well. The Germans, as I said, they caught on pretty quick to the British sniper shield and they liked the idea, so they introduced something that was a really large shield initially. This would be a magnesium steel plate, and they were essentially immobile. Uh, you'd place it at the top of a parapet and then pretty much leave it there. They wanted something that was a little more portable, so in 1916, this model was introduced, the Model 1916 Infantry Shield, of which, again, if we've already stated it, this literally translates to Infantry Shield. The idea was that a single man could carry this and deploy it and fire from behind it. Wasn't really done in practice, these are kind of bulky, they're 17 and 5 eighths inches wide, and 23 and 5 eighths, or 17 and 5 eighths inches tall, 23 and 5 eighths inches wide. So essentially 18 by 24. I probably said a, an incorrect number there at some point, but 18 by 24 is the rough measurement. But it's all rounded to 5 eighths for some reason. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. This is silicone nickel plate. It's about 30 pounds. And again, it's kind of bulky, but the intention was that a single soldier could carry this, deploy it, and use it. How they wound up being used more often than not was fairly similar to the larger shields that came earlier. Actually, they'd place them on parapets and uh, just around the edge of a trench. And then because of the size of it, they'd usually stack sandbags around it. They also often had to camouflage these. And you can actually read a bit about uh, shields popping up uh, kind of obscurely throughout a, a number of World War I memoirs and books that were written. Uh, an example is Arthur Guy Empey's book, Over the Top. He mentions that they had a German crack shot in a sector that he was stationed in at one point. I believe he refers to him as a dandy of a shot, which is a really British sounding thing to say for an American, though he was stationed with the British. But um, the British usually would take care of this once they identified the location of one by just bombing the ever-living crap out of the general area that they believed the sniper to be located in. Because from the front, these are borderline impenetrable for the British, who for the most part were firing 303 or smaller into the enemy trenches unless the artillery opened up. That's one thing also with artillery. The front of this you'll see the outside edges are curved, that is uh, to catch and stop shrapnel or debris from explosions facing out away from the shield. You'll see that this does not have any protection on the sides. It is purely to protect you from the front. And then you open up this here uh, gate, put your rifle through here, and fire. And it's got a lever on the back and a hook. And I'm going to turn it around here in a minute so you can see how this works and what I believe is the use for the hook, though I haven't really seen anything to confirm my suspicions on this, but I think it's for, for carrying purposes. You can use it to lock the leg. This does have a leg with a spike on the back. Again, we'll see that in just a moment. The Germans would wind up replacing this with the Model 1916-17, which was it's the same composite material but closer to a half inch thick and over 50 pounds with wings coming off the sides to protect you from the from your flanks. But by and large, shields would be used stationary and more or less would not move. This was one of the more widely used examples by the Germans, and they often would place them in such a way that uh, one man using one of these would be covered on both sides by uh, another shooter placed 100 yards out to either direction of where he was uh, located. So let's go ahead and spin this thing around and take a look at the back. It's, it's an interesting thing. So I'm trying to keep the hook from 
scarring up my table too much here. There we go. So you see you got this leg with a spike down at the bottom, and then this hook here, how I believe this was to be used, so if you were going to move, could lock it, and then carry it, like so. Yeah, and it's 30 pounds, and this was not something that often wound up actually being moved, but the original intention was that it could be moved and used on the go. Your gate is right here. You just open, close. I could definitely uh, do do well to clean up the back of this in a couple spots a little more, especially on these smaller pieces. The rust was even thicker on these smaller pieces than it was on the face and back. I don't know if I've actually addressed this yet, but we're actually ending the video with a look at how I uh, brought this to the condition it is that you see it in now. It was really, really, really rough when I first got it. So this is a massive improvement, believe it or not. And yeah, that's really about all that we've got for the history of these. Um, one interesting note, you can actually see uh, at least one of these in the movie 1917 when they're moving through the German trenches. If you have a sharp eye, look out on the sides and uh, at least one of these is laying on a table at one point during the trench crawl through the, through the German lines. It's a really cool thing, uh, definitely something that I'm glad to have in my collection, not something that's very common, especially here in the States. This one I think came all the way from Belarus, or Belarus, if I'm not mistaken, that that is where this originated. Though, again, these were more often used on the Western Front than anywhere else. The Brits hated them. Uh, again, you read books of the Germans uh, using their snipers very effectively, and it just was not something that was, uh, nobody was really happy when they found out that they had a sniper on the other side of the line because you couldn't really safely move around your trenches if you knew that, you know, if you have any part of you raise above ground for half a second, you're probably going to get that part shot off by someone who happens to be a crack shot. So, very interesting piece of battlefield technology. Again, just something that I'm glad to have. It's not something that I was really aware of until I got pretty deep into this hobby. So, anyway, if you've stuck around to this point, thank you very much. If you are interested in seeing how I restored this thing, we're going to begin that right here. So, thank you for watching, and if you stick around, hope you enjoy the rest of it. So here it is in precisely the condition that it arrived in. As you can see... This thing is salty, solid rust from one end to the other, front and back. I'm going to go ahead and turn it around here. Like I said, front and back, just solid rust. I mean, look at this. This is definitely a battlefield find. The gate on it actually does still work which is mildly surprising. I kind of figured that it would be rusted solid, but let's go ahead and see if we can't give this thing a bit of a uh, vinegar bath and see if that clears up some of the corrosion on here. As we previously mentioned, this thing is about 18 inches by 24 inches, and we are going to be bathing it in vinegar. We're just going with the cheapest white vinegar that I could get my hands on. I uh, just picked this up at Safeway just mere moments ago. So I've got six gallons of this. I don't know if that'll be enough. I might need to go and get more, but here we go. Let's go ahead and get the bath going. May need to go get a few more gallons. Uh, you can at least wait and see what this does to it. Shouldn't take too awful long, and I'll probably try and pick up a couple more gallons in the meantime. Another six gallons, and it is fully submerged. So now, just a waiting game. 
Um, I'll probably be checking on this every day for the next several days. You can see the water is already turning a yellowish color, so it is definitely doing something. So hopefully this will be ready in less than a week. And from there, we'll shoot what would probably actually be the first part of the video, as this will probably be the end cap. So let's see how it goes. All right, we got this started on Saturday. Uh, it is now Wednesday, so let's go ahead and take a peek. What's going on in here? That is some nasty looking water. Oh, wow. I think we might just about be there, guys. This is pretty much down to bare metal. Uh, some of the uh, smaller parts are uh, still kind of crusty. May leave it for a couple more days, but we're just about there. It's been a full week now. Let's go ahead and check on this thing again I think uh, I think the time has come I think we're gonna go ahead and pull this out of the tub uh, we're gonna use the lid to set this on so it doesn't just drip all over everything so I'm gonna set that up real quick and then we're gonna start scrubbing away got a bunch of rags made from old work shirts you can see the rust on this is pretty much free at this point. So I'm going to see what I can get to come off. And once we get this more or less dry, I'm going to be hitting it with some ballastol. Okay, I think we're going to let this uh, just kind of dry for an hour or two. I may wipe it down a little more uh, between now and when we go to apply some ballastol to it. Uh, just going to spray it on there and kind of wipe it in in the hopes that that will stop any further corrosion. But it looks like we got most of the active rust pretty well gone. And what little there is should be neutralized by the ballastol when we go to do that. So... Give it a little bit to dry, and we will return. Okay, for what will be the final step in this long process, we're going to spritz the whole thing down with ballastol, scrub it with a wire brush, and then wipe it down. So, here we go. That's the front side done. Now let's uh, go ahead and do the back. I think that's about as good as it's going to get. Hope you all have enjoyed. It's been Thomas Great Northwest Weaponry, and I will see you next time.